morning, everyone. And um, what's that nice picture doing up there? So I'm going to start off by telling you um, a little story uh, about something that happened to me oh, probably about 16 or 17 years ago now. That's a photo I took um, back then. And then I'm going to leave the little story, and then I'll come back to it at the end, because it'll sort of tie everything together. So this, this photograph was taken on a field excursion um, about 17 years ago. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to get the photograph exactly where I wanted it, but um, this was the best. So you can see where we are. I, had, um, I was part of a bigger group, but at one point I had about 15 uh, children with me, 15 students with me. And we'd probably gone just around the corner there. I'd been given the job of taking this group of students around the corner and um, it wasn't until I got, to, and we were going to visit a, a building and we were going to be shown things there and all that sort of thing. It's a very old town, this. It's about 1,500 years old. It's, um, oh, I've forgotten its name, Fen Huang or something like that. It's in, uh, it's not on the tourist trail, but it's in um, northwest China. So I was very privileged, I think, to be able to go there and take some, uh, to go with some Chinese teachers and take some students there. And I'd been given this job. Uh, which, you know, was, that was fine. But when we got round the corner and we saw where the building was, the build that we were going to, the building was on the other side of the river. And so we had to get across this river. And I, I put that photo in because it was the only one to show you what the river was like. You, you know, there weren't any stepping stones or anything. Uh, but there was a bridge. But the bridge was made of tree trunks. So if you can imagine tree trunks in the water... Yeah, that way. So upright, going across. So we had to step from tree trunk to tree trunk. Okay, across that river. And it's not a dangerous river. You can see I've done, as a geography teacher, I've done scarier things. But I had, um, I had one boy with me called David. And he was lovely. David was very nice. He was a lovely boy. But he was Mr. Anxiety. Um, he was not physically athletic. He, um, he, wasn't, he was, certainly wasn't bullied by the other kids because Hong Kong kids don't tend to bully people, but he, he didn't fit in. He was a bit sort of socially inept as well. Um, and I had David with me and about 14 or 15 other children, and I thought, if David won't go across this river, then we're all going to have to go back because, um, you know, he... He just was Mr. Anxiety. I could see him looking at these, these stepping stone tree trunk things. And I was thinking, well, the only other person who'd probably fall in is me. And that's all right. They'll just laugh at that. So that's OK. But if he falls in, it's going to be a bit of a, a to-do. So I sent the first half of the students over, of the kids over, you know, the most athletic, the most outgoing, the ones who were laughing all the way, you know, top, 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 all the way across. And that was fine. And then I thought, well, I've got to put David in the middle. OK, so he's going to have to go in the middle. And we talk, we'd spoken about it, and we'd, he'd seen all the other students go over, and he'd seen all those sorts of things. So um, I thought, OK, this is it. We can't hold his hand going across. You know, the water's too deep. If he falls in, I wasn't sure if the other kids could swim. It's not, it's not something that Hong Kong kids do. They, they don't swim a lot. They play basketball and things. That's about it, really. I thought, well, I can swim, so I can go and get him. That'll be all right. Um, but you know what? He just jumped across like a little deer. He loved it, and he was laughing, and it was just so wonderful. Because he'd seen the other kids go, and then and he was being cheered as well. The kids cheered him. The ones that had already gone over cheered, and the ones on the side with me went, um, cheered him. So it all worked out very well. And I got across okay as well. I knew you were wondering about that. So, yeah. But, but it was... It, it wasn't a dangerous thing to do, but it was one of those things that was um, different. I've never seen a bridge quite like that one. And um, it was very interesting. But this was a very interesting place because I actually hear um, women were washing in the river. They were washing their clothes in the river. And um, one, of, one of my students cut his finger quite badly. And the answer to that was no Band-Aids or anything. They got um, uh, spider webs 
they pulled spider webs down and put them on, onto the cut. That was, that was the antiseptic that they had and the Band-Aid that they put around it. So this was quite a remote place. Now, keep that story with you. Just keep that with you for the moment, if that's all right, because I will come back to that. There is a reason why I'm telling you that. Um, now, why, I, why I'm here and what I'm going to talk to you about is I, I want to ask you a question. And that question is, are you willing to be persecuted for your Christian faith? Okay? Because this is something that has been on my mind a lot recently. Am I really willing to be persecuted for my Christian faith? Um, as we've been saying very clearly recently, we're coming out of a, a world-changing series of events, and the church is coming out to be different to the one that it went in. Now, I know that for some of you, that question might not be relevant. You might say, well, I've already been persecuted for my, for my Christian faith. So are you, I suppose the question for you would be, are you willing to continue being persecuted for your Christian faith? Or are you willing to be re-persecuted? Um, I think the worst, in all honesty, the worst that's ever happened to me probably is I've lost a few friends on Facebook. And that's, you know... Um, I, I, I haven't really been persecuted, so this, this question is very pertinent to me. And I just want to uh, move on, because um, I came across this... Um, it's not so much a verse in the Bible, but it's a heading to a series of verses in John 15, um, verse 18. It says, true disciples can expect persecution. It's there. It, it, I checked in the NIV, and it was in the Passion Translation as well. It says it there. True disciples can expect persecution. And we're, we're living in a very, very different world to the one that was in existence even five years ago, aren't we? Things are changing rapidly. The way people are perceiving the world is changing rapidly. And so within that, the, ch the Christian church has to respond. So I'd like to just give two examples um, to move on with this idea of persecution and what persecution looks like. Uh, and then I'm going to come back to this picture. So um, the first one is uh, to talk about one of my heroes in the Bible, and that's Stephen. I know um, Sean's hero, he tells us a few times, is Peter. But I've often admired Stephen enormously um, in his story is mainly in chapter 7 of Acts. And he's the, um, the person who... Um, I just want to pick out four aspects of his life. It's not, I'm not going to just concentrate fully on him. But uh, first of all, I want to make the point that he had two sets of enemies because he was the first person to be martyred for his faith, or that we know of anyway. He had two sets of enemies. One set of enemies were the Pharisees, but the other set of enemies he had were some of the people that he was talking to in the marketplace and in, in the, the, you know, it, around about when he was going around um, talking to people. First of all, he was an ordinary man. He wasn't an apostle. He wasn't somebody in, with a high standing in the church. He, he was recognized and he was admired. He was somebody who helped... I think, to feed the widows within the church. But he wasn't a, a high-profile person in the church. I think that's important to emphasize. He was an ordinary person. The people who he initially upset, um, they belonged to a sect called the Men Set Free. And they were, um, it is thought, possibly, they were ex Hebrew slaves who had got their freedom, and they were following a Roman mythical hero called Liber, and it's where we get the word liberation from, on liberty, um, and they were the enemies of Stephen, really, because to them, liberty meant um, promiscuity, it meant drunk drunkenness, it meant licentiousness. They, they were following all these habits that when Stephen came in and, you know, and proclaimed the gospel, full of the Holy Spirit as he did, um, they didn't like that. It really offended them, it upset them a great deal. And so they started a whole series of... Um, talk tactics in the marketplace, you know, lies and semi-lies and all the things to try and turn the people against him. And so these men set free, these followers of liberty, 
um, really stirred up the crowds against Stephen. Um, the second set of people who were against him, not surprisingly, were the Pharisees. And they were the people eventually who decided that he was going to, his life was going to come to an end and he was stoned to death. Um, what I found interesting is if you continue reading towards the end of chapter 7 in Acts, um, as, he was, as he was being dragged away to, to, for his life to be ended, his earthly life to be ended, and he saw Jesus sort of standing at the, um, at the door of heaven to welcome him in, all the Pharisees and the people who were going to stone him put their hands over their ears and started shouting at the top of their voices because they couldn't actually listen to what he was saying. It was so obnoxious to them. It was so something they didn't want to hear. Just like, um, you know, in the French Revolution, when the drum roll came as the person was stepping up the steps towards the guillotine. I always thought the drum, the drum roll was for effect, but it wasn't apparently. It was to drown out the final words of the person whose head was being put onto the guillotine stand so that you couldn't hear what they were saying. And these people here were doing exactly the same thing. They, um, they put their hands over their ears and they were shouting at the top of their voices so they couldn't actually hear what Stephen was saying and what the vision that he had and what he was doing. Isn't that like the world that we're living in nowadays? That somehow the Christian message, the Christian message when you try to proclaim it to people, they sort of like shout at you. They put their hands, metaphorically, put their hands over their ears and they shake their heads and they change the subject really quickly and say, I don't want to talk about things like that and all that sort of thing. The world that Stephen was living in is very similar to the world that we're living in now. Was Stephen angry or bitter or was he, was he um, actually shaking his fist at God saying, God, why is this happening to me? Why are you doing this to me? You know, I've given my life to you. Save me. Did he, did he say any of that? Well, no, he didn't. He didn't do that. He'd given his life fully and completely to God. His faith was complete. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. There was no doubt in his mind that what was happening to him was the will of God. And as um, most, I'm sure you all know, that um, the persecution that started in Jerusalem came directly from the death of Stephen. And that meant people left Jerusalem. And so the message of the gospel left Jerusalem as well, and it got sent around that part of Asia Minor. And one could argue that this, the death of Stephen started that whole thing off. Um, so God's will was in. Um, Stephen allowed God to use his life to spread the gospel more, absolutely fully. So in that case, I'm not suggesting that any of us are going to be persecuted in that way, but I always feel very, very encouraged by what Stephen was willing to do and how God used what Stephen um, was willing to do in his life for, for the glory of God. Um, because love was the motivation of Stephen's life. Um, if you look in 1 Corinthians 13, everybody starts, whenever you say 1 Corinthians 13, people start to really start to think about verse 4, don't they? Love is, and all the things that love is. But if you go to the first three verses of 1 Corinthians 13, it tells you about what happens if love isn't at the center of your life. Um, I'll just read one little bit. Um, it talks about... Um, if you don't do things from the motivation of love and full of the Holy Spirit, then you can produce nothing of value. Um, that your life becomes just like um, the things you say are just like a hollow sound of a clanging cymbal. And it says in uh, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 3, If I offer my body to be burned without the pure motive of love, I would gain nothing of value. So it's all about motiva being motivated by love. I do believe very strongly that Stephen was motivated by love, very strongly. He, he knew what he was doing and why was he was doing it. He wasn't anxious. He wasn't resentful. He wasn't bitter. He wasn't thinking why. He knew that God was in control, and he was absolutely 
um, convinced that his life would bring glory to God, which, of course, we know it did. And um, here we are, 2,000 years later, thanking people like Stephen that they were willing to do what they did so that we could hear the gospel at some point in our life. And like John was saying, we probably all were being spoken to many times, but eventually we heard and we, we took the, the, the message into our hearts. Okay, so that's Stephen. So the second um, place I would like to look, and can I have the second slide, please? Um, oh. It does continue. Could you continue that then, please? Yeah, thank you very much. Right. Um, okay, so this is the letter to Sardis. Um, so we have, um, I'm sure you know, in Revelation 3, we have seven letters to seven churches that were all found in what is present-day Turkey. So almost like in a crescent, if you look on the map, where they are. And this is the particular letters, a letter which was written to the leaders, because um, they're written to the messengers, the, the leaders who ran the church in this city called Sardis. And again, I'd just like to use a few illustrations to show how the church, more to do with the church that we have that was in the 20th century, in the beginning of the 21st century, how it won't do anymore. It's got to be changed somehow. Somehow we've got to be get, become more real because if we really are going to reach out to the world out there, we have to, we have to be filled more with the glory of God. We have to be dead more to ourselves and more in tune with what it is that God really wants for our life. And that could include persecution. I think God just wants us to be willing for it to include that possibility. He's not wagging fingers at us and saying, you've got to be persecuted. He's saying, will you give your life to me so that your life is a love offering to me forever? And he just wants us to say yes to that. So um, can I just leave you for just for a moment? I'm sure you're familiar with it. Could you just read the letter that's up there um, in Revelation 3? Um, or perhaps I'll just read it out as well, because that means I can do something as well. I know all that you do, and I know that you have a reputation for being really alive, but you're actually dead. Wake up and strengthen all that remains before it dies. For I haven't found your works to be perfect in the sight of my God. So remember, remember something, the things you've received and heard, then turn back to God and obey them. For if you continue to slumber, I will come to you like a thief and you'll have no idea of what hour I will come. Yet there are still a few in Sardis who have remained pure and have not soiled their garments and they will walk in fellowship with me in brilliant light or in white for they are worthy and the ones who experience victory will be dressed in white robes and I will never, no never erase their name from the book of life. I will acknowledge your name before my father and his angels. So the one whose heart is open, let him listen carefully to what the Spirit is now saying to all the churches. So this is, so this is particularly... And when I read that, I just thought, gosh, the church that possibly I've known in my what is now becoming a relatively long life has, re has reflections of what Sardis was back way then in 2,000 years ago. Um, did lots of work, did lots of works. It was very functional, very alive. But actually, because the motivations that were going on within the people's hearts, it was actually dead. Sardis is called the sleeping city. Um, I found out when I was sort of researching all this. It was the one that was asleep. It wasn't really awake to what God wanted from it. Again, I've just got three points here I'd like to make about Sardis. I'm not, again, doing everything that you could possibly say about Sardis, just three. First of all, it's geographical position. When you read that, you have to know that Sardis was positioned on a very high point, and it had a river like a moat going around the bottom. So it was very, very well protected. But nonetheless, it still got um, 
enemies were able to um, assault it and get in on two different occasions because they were slumbering, they were content. Um, what was happening in the physical was also true of the church that resided here in Sardis. They were very... Um, they were just going away around with their lives. I'll come on to that in a moment. Because the prevailing culture in Sardis, they were complacent. They, they didn't watch. They were unwatchful. Um, they, they had ease and affluence and prosperous. They were very prosperous church. Um, and they were very, very multicultural. They, in, in Sardis, Jesus was presented as a way and a truth and a life, not the way, the truth and the life. Because they were very multicultural and I was watching a really interesting YouTube program um, presented by a Christian archeologist. And he, he was saying that how they found all these um, remains and ruins in Sardis that show that the Christians were just part of everything. It was a real polyglot of faiths and everybody was accepting everybody else and there was lots of tolerance and all those sorts of things. So doesn't that really reflect what's going on in our world at the moment and what a lot of our church people who are members of the church are also certainly um, being enticed to do. We're not being encouraged to stand like um, Sean was saying this morning you know we stand on the Bible and we stand on what it says um, but we, we so easily we compromise and go and sort of say oh okay but yeah okay we can bring that in that's okay and we'll tolerate that and we'll tolerate this but the Sardis church as far as I could make out was not a persecuted church and it wasn't persecuted because it didn't need to be because they tolerated everything. They, they were easy with, other, with differences. They, they would have presented their beliefs, but they wouldn't have said they were the only way. They would have said they are a way. And so they were able to get out of the, the persecution part of the thing. This is a, a particular point in time for Sardis. I don't think it was always, always true. Um, so what they did in Sardis lacked God's power. So they didn't see the miracles and they didn't see all the amazing things that we read about in the beginning of Acts. They didn't do those things. They just, they had a church and they had Christians. Um, and these people who were wearing white, um, the leaders who were reading this letter, who'd gone and collected this letter from John and were reading it, they knew exactly what that was, that was talking about. In Sardis, there was a temple to um, a goddess called Sibylle. And she was the goddess of wild nature. And um, I, I don't... She, she wasn't in any way a Christian goddess, but her temple... Um, I have, I, I've seen um, on my travels, I've seen, I didn't realize at the time, but I have seen pictures of her. She was the goddess in a chariot who was being... Um, drawn by lions. That, that was how she was depicted. And she, that was found all over Sardis, that particular depiction. Um, but to approach her temple in Sardis, you had to have clean clothes on. You couldn't go inside her temple if your clothes were soiled in any way. So this letter to the people of Sardis, to the Christians in Sardis, is really saying, your clothes have to be clean for me, not for that goddess you know, cut off everything from her in every way whatsoever. You need to be mine. Your clothes need to be clean for me and to wear white for me. So it's there. Um, so I've got just one reference here from 2 Timothy 3, verse 45, which um, possibly sums up all that Sardis was. They find their delight in the pleasures of this world more than the pleasures of the loving God. They may pretend to have a respect for God, but in reality, they want nothing to do with God's power. And they were, as a consequence, grieving the Holy Spirit. And I just felt um, this was actually where, it was this picture of Sardis is where I started when I was preparing for, for this evening. I thought, um, 
so much that reflects the world that we live in today and what uh, certainly parts of the church have become today. They've become compromised. They've become very, very safe. And um, their theology has become weak and non-confrontational. And I think we're being called in this post-COVID latter part of 2020 and on world to be more confr confrontational, to actually stand for what we really do believe in, what the Bible is really saying to us. Um, okay, so can I go back to the original photo now, please? Okay, so at the beginning of this um, little presentation, I told you a true story about how myself and 15 students got over a rather unusual bridge in this little town here. I'd now like to use that illustration as a metaphor so that you can go out this evening with a picture in your head because it's so easy to just forget what's being said, isn't it, and things. But I was hoping that if I can just retell the story of us crossing the river in a slightly different way, uh, in the light of the things I've spoken about, it, um, it might be something you can take away with us. So we found ourselves on the wrong side of the river. I mean, that was just how it was. And to get across, we had to go across this particular um, tree stump bridge to get to where we were, where our destination was. I'd like you to think of that destination as the discipleship building, all right? So we're going to get over the river to go to the discipleship building. That's where disciples live. And we're on the other side of the river at the moment. So to get to our destination, we have to cross the river. I want you to think of each of the um, tree trunks that are, have been embedded in the river to give us access to this building as the choices that we make. Um, we've been talking a lot recently about repentance. We've been talking a lot recently about renewing our mind, about having our flesh you know, on the cross and all those sorts of things. And they're all relevant, but I'd like to ask you to include in those questions, am I willing to be persecuted for my faith? Am I willing to be persecuted for my Lord? And that would be one of the tree stumps that's in the river. And as you go across, one of the things I didn't say is that the tree stumps were only just big enough for one foot. So you, when you went on, it was like that, and then you had to go to the next one. I, I was, I, my balance was a bit better in those days than it is now. But you know, you, you just had to go across like that. I think there was one or two in the middle which were a bit bigger. You can stop, but you couldn't really hesitate. Uh, once you, this is why David was just so wonderful. My little worrier, David, he decided to go and he he went, and you couldn't you couldn't miss a tree stump. You couldn't jump over one and say, oh, I don't like that one. I'll jump over that one and go on to that, because you'd fall in the water. So you, if, you, if you can imagine each of those tree stumps as choices, as questions that you need to answer about your life, and, and this is your relationship with God, um, how are you going to, you know, you've probably answered an awful lot of those, but I would like to ask you, has one of those questions been, am I willing to be persecuted for you? Uh, because you can't jump over one, because if you do, you'll fall in the river. And the river, however gentle, this isn't a fast flowing river, but there's a flow with it. And the longer you stay in the river, the further away you'll get from that bridge, and the harder it will be to get back to that particular bridge to cross. So you don't really, you need to know the answer to each question before you go over onto the other side. So um, what is the river? I think the river represents our anxieties and our, um, our fears, but also our contentment and our cushiness of life. We're Westerners. We have very, very fortunate lives, don't we? We didn't ask to be born Western, but we are. And, and Largely speaking, all our needs are satisfied. Are we willing to give those things up if required? You know, all those, that sort of stuff. So I think the, I'm asking the river to be all the, the things that would keep us away from making the choices that lead towards contentment, so lead towards discipleship. Sorry, so if we fall in there, we're in danger of flowing away again from 
the river from, from the, the bridge that we've got there. But to get to that side, God's looking for people who are willing to be those people who are wearing white. In, um, in Sardis, there was only a small number of people he recognized as really being his people. Is that true in the world today? I honestly don't know. How many of us there are, you know, but how many of the Christians we have, uh, that he can count on to go the whole way as far as discipleship is concerned? But if I just go back um, by way of uh, completion and saying from John 15, 18, true disciples can expect persecution. Um, just remember, when the unbelieving world hates you, they, they first hated me. Um, they'll hate you, not because you're you. They'll hate you because you love your Lord first. And that's that, what it's all about. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>